What's up everybody, Johannes here. Welcome back to yet another masterclass. Today we're gonna dive right in. We're gonna work on the Dvorak Cello Concerto. Uh, that was on the top of the list of your requests, closely followed by Haydn D and I think it was Sassens and Lalo on a tie. So those are the pieces that we're gonna work on this week, but I thought we would start with the infamous sixtuplet passage of the first movement of the Dvorak Cello Concerto. I'm going to give you a very structured approach, just like I did with Saint-Saëns. But before we dive into the details on how to work on this passage, I want to give you a little bit of background, because these six toplets were not Dvorak's idea originally. Um, just a quick reminder what is going on in the orchestra. Uh, the woodwinds play a really beautiful melody. Dvorak's original idea was to have the cello play the following. Now, Hanus Vihan, for whom this concerto is written, looked at this music and said, mm -mm, Antonin, this is not difficult enough. I want something more brilliant. And Hanus Vihan actually suggested these six toplets. And you can see that when you look at the autograph of the Dvorak Cello Concerto, that originally he had in the music, and then he crossed it out actually in the part. So this must have happened quite late in the process, and he replaced it with... Uh... So now, thanks to Hanusz Vihan, cellists all over the world have to practice just so much more. However, it is a beautiful passage, and I think Hanusz Vihan didn't do any harm. The problem is that nowadays, when it comes to this passage, cellists think that because it's difficult and because it needs to bounce in the bow, suddenly they need to take off like a Formula One race car. So they arrive at this passage. <laughs> and suddenly take off like crazy. And I just think it's good that we are always reminded of the origin of this passage, that it is very singing and very lyrical. And we should accompany the lyricism of the woodwinds with our six toplet. So instead of throwing on the race car motor, we should actually be much more sensitive, something like this. So, that's a little bit of background. We're going to come back to the musical ideas at the end of the masterclass. Now I want to start working on the technical details. Let's start with the left hand. When I began practicing the Dvorak Concerto, I was practicing a lot of double stops in order to get the structure into the hand. Now, in principle, that is not a bad idea. However, you really run into problems with intonation. You all know that when we play double stops, the intonation is different than when we play individual notes. Now, although, of course, this sextuplet is very quick, still, these are individual notes. So, if you really nail the intonation with your double stops, chances are that it's probably going to be out of tune once you play single notes. So, don't use this technique of playing the double stops, but rather practice with individual notes. And we're going to do the same thing between D and G strings. It is good to isolate first A and D and then D and G string and then later on, you put the whole thing together. Yeah. 
Just let me mention the fingering real quick. I see a lot of people play um, thumb two three and then thumb one three. And I personally do stay on thumb two three and then I go to thumb one four so that actually I can keep this section of the hand relatively compact and centered. What is most tricky for me in terms of intonation are the larger shifts. So we have the shift from the B to the F sharp and respectively the other fingers. So this is something that I would isolate in the practice. And also do it with the other fingers. Even more challenging, I find the shift from G to D. We can actually use the fifth to practice that. And then, for example, add the third in the lower position and then move to the fifth in the top position. The challenge for most people is to combine the movement of the left hand with the rapid motion of the right hand. I often hear uncoordinated shifts, meaning that the left hand is moving before the right hand has played. We definitely want to avoid that. What we want is a very clear shift on the A string. Which brings me right into how we should practice with the right hand. I do suggest rhythmical patterns. If we want to practice the top shift, it's very useful to play the notes on the A string longer. Another problem that I often hear is that a lot of cellists don't think of the appo accent. Then it sounds a little bit like this. But actually we would like to hear very pronounced bass notes. Now we're going to turn the pattern around, we're going to elongate the bass notes. do play the elongated notes with a little bit of an accent just so you get used to that little bit of an impulse that we will need later on. As we are picking up the tempo, I always want you to remember that up bow accent. We have better pronunciation of the bass note. And just to complete the cycle, let's elongate the middle notes. Throughout the process, it is very important that your thumb doesn't have a locked joint, but that you always keep a curved joint. It is very difficult with a locked joint to be flexible with the intonation, because once you start moving around, it is very hard to keep the intonation with a locked joint. So always keep it flexible. Now the best strategy that you should apply to increase the tempo, of course, is using metronome. So like in Sassans, we start at 60, tomorrow is 62, day after 64. You just gradually increase the tempo. Don't practice too fast, too quickly. The question that always exists is how to make the bow bounce. It is good to remember that the bow has a bouncing quality in itself. If you let the bow fall, it has a built-in trampoline effect. I personally find it very useful, like I said before, to use accents not only in the down bow but also in the up bow which gives the bow some momentum. Now let me increase the action of the accents a little bit. And please also notice that I'm curving the bow so that the tip is going upwards and the hand is going down. I do not believe that we have to turn this into a spiccatissimo uh, virtuoso moment. But actually, as I said in the beginning, we can play this rather cantabile. We can actually be a servant 
to the beautiful line in the woodwinds. Now we're going to go full circle and I'm going to talk about that musical aspect again that we have. Um, let's look at the line again that we have in the woodwinds. There is a crescendo going down to the F sharp and I wonder if that is something that we could actually be part of. If you listen closely, I'm actually elongating that first F sharp in order to make it a little bit more singing. Let me play it again. By elongating a couple of the notes just a little bit, you give us the illusion that you're actually very much part of that molto cantabile where, you know, in our minds, of course, we are working very hard <laughs> to get this in tune and to get this uh, sparkling. And just food for thought, for the end of the passage, I try to show the moving notes. Yeah, so you have on the D string and on the G string you have that's it and on the A string it stays on one note so you don't need to show anything there but it's very nice to actually show the movement on the D string and once you play this a little bit more musical you realize that it also connects much nicer to the following passage. Because one of the big dangers of the Dvorak Concerto is that you have one difficult spot and another difficult spot and a third difficult spot and they all have their individual tempo and character and nothing really gels together. All right, so these are some tips to work on that wonderful passage. I hope this inspires you. Let me know what should be the next passage from Dvorak that you would like to hear. And tomorrow I think we'll continue with third movement of Saint-Saëns just to work a little bit on speed because I know some of you were wondering how to increase speed and how to work on fast passages. I hope this was fun and I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow.